<laughs> okay, recording has lipstick. begun, uh, and it's okay. one o'clock, and we've got almost fifty people in attendance. So hey. let's kick this thing off. Wow. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. I'm going to go straight into sharing my screen. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this panel that I'm so excited about that I first started thinking about um, back. I don't know, almost a year ago, uh, when I was thinking about uh, the ways in which the Asian American community has been impacted by craziness around the pandemic. Uh, and I, I'm always interested in autobiocomics because uh, the ability for a cartoonist to express what he or she or they um, are thinking or feeling or experiencing is such a wonderful way to experience comics. So I am going to go through a little slideshow. Uh, and um, in case you're not familiar with the work of these uh, four wonderful cartoonists, uh, and I am encouraging them to chime in and make comments or uh, uh, corrections or I don't know, anything, amplifications uh, <laughs> wherever possible. And then we'll get to a general discussion. Um, and yes, Liz Francis, I am also a huge fan of all of them. <laughs> okay, Aww. here we go. Starting with Connie Sun. Uh, I've got everybody's Instagram on their little bio page. Um, I'm not uh, gonna read the bio. I feel like uh, everybody can do that for themselves. Um, but we're starting with Connie and Connie's uh, slides kind of go back and forth. Uh, there's some recent general ones, then it goes back in time a little bit, and then it kind of comes forward. Um, there is an elephant that shows up in many of Connie's uh, web comics, autobio web comics, and um, I will let Connie address the elephant in the room, so to speak, <laughs> uh, if she likes. Um, but uh, they're not in a lot of the ones that we have here. Uh, Connie's depiction of herself also changes a little bit over time, which I also find really interesting. Um, and that's kind of the, the part of the theme, right? Like, how do you picture yourself? Um, a lot of Connie's early stuff had to do with uh, uh, romantic expectations, um, failed or fulfilled. Uh, so it's, it's great to have um, have some of that representative uh, material in there. I, am I going slow enough for everybody to read? Um, I'm not. I'm not cutting off the punchline for anybody. I hope. Okay. Uh, this one, you know, I always love a really good New York um, subway comic, and uh, this was kind of lovely uh, watching this couple as they realize that they are definitely going in the right direction. Um, um, and sorry, then we Karen? get back to, yes. Karen, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure if um, the slides are syncing to what you're describing. So we may have skipped Oh, something. and that's fine. I can roll with this. <laughs> um, do you want me to um, speak to any of the, any of the um, comics that um, we've shown so far? You can speak to whatever you're seeing and I will uh, get to it. If, I mean, if, sure, if it's sure. what you're seeing, then, then yeah. it's so what everybody else is seeing. So, um, so I, see the, um, I see the Subway comic now. This is- um, Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, so okay. there's a little bit of a delay. Um, it, I, I'm not sure if it's, it's sort of just scrolling through um, the okay. comics that-, that um, that are displaying, but I'm happy to talk okay. Would to, you, to did, speak to any of this. Did you want to say anything about, about that comic or any of the ones that we've gone through so far? Sure, um, I, I, can, I can just very briefly talk about this practice that I have. Um, you know, I've been drawing comics for about 10 years now um, and it wasn't my main you know, career for a long time. And what I did was um, I, I decided that, you know, I really needed, um, 
you know, a way to express myself. And I, you know, I needed to sort of see myself in, um, you know, the media that I was consuming. And, um, and that was sometimes hard to find. And so the comics that I'm, um, that I'm sharing today are from um, a, a daily practice that I had of um, drawing a comic every morning before I went to work. Um, so that's the, that's the context for these. Um, you know, they are very, uh, many of them are very loose and um, uh, sort of as off the cuff of, as comics um, should, you know, can be. Um, and, you know, like if it, if it comes off as, you know, very sketchy or very raw, um, that's because it was. I, I, I didn't give myself that much time <laughs> before work. It was more, it was more about the practice than the product. Um, and when I started this, um, I was very, very new to comics. I didn't grow up, uh, you know, reading a lot of comics. Um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with this form until, um, you know, quite late in my adult life. Um, and the way that my, my entry was basically, um, you know, first discovering, you know, like cartoonists like uh, Mari Naomi and Laura Park, you know, like I was like, oh, they're doing something and I am drawn to it and I don't know how they're doing it. I've never done this before. And so, um, you know, the daily practice of drawing a cartoon a day was basically just saying, you know, I, I need to learn how to do this. Um, and there was like a desperation to that. It's like, I really need to learn this medium. And I, and I learned it by, by doing um, and throwing myself in and drawing a lot of like years and years of bad comics because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so that's the context, which is that I started from like, you know, what felt like nothing. Um, and I drew in inspiration from anything that I could get my hands on um, while I was in another career, you know, with, with had nothing to do with, mm -hmm. with comics. I, I actually used to, um, you know, work in program management at um, Columbia University, which is um, where I met um, the one and only Karen Green, um, who at that <laughs> time was building, you know, this entire, you know, um, um, library and like, you know, bringing the culture of um, um, independent and commercial comics to academia. And that was like my education. I was like the luckiest person in the world um, as she was growing the Columbia University, you know, uh, comics collection. Like I was always in the stacks checking out comics <laughs> like it, on my lunch hour. <laughs> Um, so forgive me if I, you know, um, if I went on, but, um, but that is the, that's the context for, you know, the images that are sort of scroll, you know, that are sort of like, that you're scrolling through right now. And, um, you know, you don't have to, Honey, you know, while you, while your work's up, can I ask you a question about it? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if that's derailed. Um, I just, I haven't seen you, you usually, your comics are usually your character, and it was interesting seeing the subway one. Did it become just you as the pandemic hit or was that on purpose that um, you're kind of in a box on your own? Um, I think it was just like a limitation. Like I'm still learning. I feel like I'm still learning, but like it's, it's you know, how much can you draw? <laughs> you know, so it became like, you know, sort of like, um, you know, like, what can I pull off, like, in the morning before I go to work? And like, what am I comfortable enough to attempt to draw? Um, and, and um, what I admire about um, all the panelists comics is, and I, and I'm always like striving to be more honest in my own artwork. And I, and I admire all of you so much, because like that is what, like what you do is what I'm striving for. I'm just like, how could they be so like honest, like with their, <laughs> and authentic with their work? Like I, I'm um, so so I'm I'm digressing a little, but um, you know the the way that I approached auto uh, autobiography and comics like wasn't so much planned as like me just processing, um, you know, kind of what 
was happening around me. So that was, um, you know, a Subway comic from 2016. Um, and like, I, I was just processing something and it was very, very loosely drawn, um, you know, um, not, you know, it's very imperfect, but that's what I was able to pull off in a morning. Um, and, and, you know, like, I, I think that the, the range of my drawings is just whatever I'm able to pull off, like skill, skill wise at that particular moment. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Connie. That was amazing. Um, I hope everybody had a chance to, to see, you know, I have no idea now how what I have on my screen is syncing with what you have on your screen. Um, I have Laura Park's uh, bio slide up at the moment. I don't know if anybody's seeing that, but Laura, you're up next. Not yet. Um, I don't see it. Oh, oh there it is. God. There we go. Shortest bio. <laughs> <laughs> succinct, succinct, Laura. <laughs> Facts, um, provable. Currently living in France, indeed. Uh, Laura's cartoons are, um, Laura's co comics and cartoons are, are lovely moments, I felt. Uh, you know, there's, there's the dog cartoons, which are so charming. And then there's the dog cartoon that is heartbreaking. Um, and there's a kind of interesting variety, I felt, in both the way you depict yourself, the way you look at yourself, and the way you look at the world around you. So um, I'm just going to go through. And if you want to chime in and uh, say anything at any point, please feel free. Um, but yeah, do you desire control? Can you master chaos? That's the question I think we all ask ourselves every day. <laughs> Um, there might be a slight, what delay. I have up, I think that that's what it is. I think there's a bit of a lag. Um, so I'm going to try and go through a, a little more slowly. Um, uh, Lewis and Beluga, everybody here seems very pet friendly. Uh, so I was really happy to see well, very um, lonely, uh, solitary people. I mean, you have to have a familiar, oh. like a witch. <laughs> <laughs> right. So after the lovely um, Lewis and Beluga uh, comic, there's this heartbreaking comic about the loss of Lewis and wanting to preserve under glass all of the, the things that remind you of Lewis, um, including yourself. Uh, I, this, any of us who've had pets who have left us can, I think, really feel this one um it's what's showing yeah everybody can see that no, one. no not yet not yet <laughs> yeah it's a it's a oh um, pretty long God. delay um i'm not sure it, if it does seem to me yeah it is funny with the context of the comic on the screen now because i have the <laughs> master chaos and <laughs> yeah <laughs> there we go clearly i cannot master chaos <laughs> um, so you guys haven't even seen Lewis and Beluga yet. Oh no. my gosh, oh. this is going to be interesting. Um, Should we let them scroll? Well, and maybe um, maybe we could just um, take turn take turns talking to talking about the selection of comics. Maybe I think that might. Yeah, I think we're having a trouble with syncing sure. up. So um, you can let them scroll, and I will say in mm -hmm. general, if you do some light googling. You should be able to find the images. Um, the one on screen now is one after my cat died. And um, I tried to send Karen images that show, um, they're autobiographical, but you have a lot of variety on how you can approach memory and um, communicate things in comics that you don't. And, and I mean, the idea of mastering chaos and also uh, trying to encapsulate moments of time, you really have so much at your disposal because there's an intimacy to comics. So effectively, if you can show and use the right words, you can bring people into a moment of time that I think is um, just really immediate and maybe harder in other forms. Um, which is weird because I feel like that kind of time travel and transportation shouldn't be possible in <laughs> drawing little images in sequence, but it does work. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's a mix. There are a lot of things with pets because um, it, it, I love animals and they're really friendly. Also, you don't have to guard their privacy at all. It's kind of <laughs> all up for grabs. Um, and often the pet ones can be something to make me smile um, because it's just an uncomplicated adoration. I think the one on screen, this is just me overloading on watching cop dramas, which like, you know, I'm rethinking because, you know, uh, don't want to really support that, but just kind of talking in that patter um, nonstop. And that was something I was actually doing because I walked my dog during the day when no one was there. So it wasn't a problem to be really strange with it. Oh, I'm seeing some things in the chat. Um, oh. I am not on screen for some people. Um, I think maybe that I'm oh. on mic. Um, you're on my screen. I can only see Connie oh. on screen. Maybe, maybe anybody who's not talking should turn off video. Um, um, can happen. We, um, okay. <laughs> I'll zoom. Um, well, <laughs> I'm not sure how to, I'm just going to barrel on because we're going to have lots of moments between us as we can. And if you can see the art, great. If not, hopefully you can see it um, later. This is a sketchbook spread. Um, and it started, this is not a, a planned thing. So I think here I was just thinking about plates of food and really wanting to think about the perspective of um, what looking down at a plate of food because um, there's something interesting about a panel and you use actually everything on here, like the observational sketch, it's using the frame as if you're looking behind my eyes. And that was interesting. So this was a, I don't know, I, I think I've done a few comics actually on like, childhood food but it's like a smell it'll really bring back a memory this one is probably impossible to read on screen but I do believe I have it somewhere online so you could dig and find that um so it's various assortments of cafeteria and home foods um and a little memory regarding that also oh and now it has switched uh this is a comic I did a couple years ago and it was I had to do my big physical combined with a bunch of thyroid cancer tests and it was I think this was insurance reasons the reason I have like like a two-day span where every part of my body was like examined it's they take all your fluids they zap they, you know look at your insides and it was really strange and it was really, it's strange being in the hospital and feeling like you're a vehicle going in for service. <laughs> um, and there are certain things that like get stuck in my mind. And for this, like it was the, the speech from um, Full Metal Jacket that was somehow like stuck in my brain. Hmm. Um, and it all uh. worked out and it wasn't, I don't know, these are things that just, kind of come together. I hadn't really planned this. This wasn't a lot of sketching. It was just trying to think about the moment and then thinking about um, wanting repetition, but wanting the center panel. I don't know. Um, maybe other people can speak about that, like how you have a page and when you're really constructing it and it just seems to work out. And that is the most uh, satisfying because um, this had been a time where I just felt like this is my whole life now. It's just doing these weird little checkups and trying to figure out how to talk about that. And I didn't really feel it was interesting to explain many details because I think there are other comics about illness that really do that. So this is just the approach I took, which it's so powerful. I don't know. You thank you. <laughs> it's interesting what you say about the intimacy of comics, Laura. Um, when I talk with my students about how, like how to read comics, uh, I talk, we talk about the interactive nature, um, you know, out of McLeod, basically that notion of closure that, that the, the reader becomes almost uh, a co-creator as he or she or they go through 
um, each panel and figure out how to put them together. And maybe that is what contributes to the intimacy of comics as opposed to a more passive medium like film or, or prose or, I don't know, other mediums. Um, it, because it they really are getting something in, to do to in between yeah. the lines of your, of your story. There's that, and I think in a world where everything- I'm not sure you what, just, what you see I mean, on your screen at you, the moment. I so. see a hamburger sandwich. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a really handmade thing. I like, Laura, I mean, I can't off hear of you, my borders. But oh, you're really? not muted on my, on my machine. I can hear I you. Can, I can hear okay, you. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, I'm just gonna keep going on. Um, no, I, I mean, you, you can see oh, here can. that the panels aren't really straight experience. and um, I don't really straighten the panels because I think there's something about um, an explicitly handmade thing. This is also why a hand letter that makes it even more intimate and often, I mean, we're on screens, but um, sometimes I draw quite small. And again, with the idea that you will, you will peer your head in. Um, these are more diary moments on the screen now of, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I rescued a bee and I saw someone fart and and I dated these as if that was really key but um uh, it's a good memory for me um and I do like drawing myself looking through a window and um because I also like that implied in that the reader is looking over my shoulder in the window and that's sort of um conceptually delightful to me I did save this beat and this does work. If you give them a little honey and warm them up, they are <laughs> like good to go. So this is also an instruction. I like to gently blow uh, on them. Oh, does that work? I, it's working okay. uh, for me, yeah. <laughs> I will take that hint. Uh, but yes, the honey one is very good. Yeah, we had a, a, a hornet or no, a wasp get in the house the middle of winter and we had that thing captive for like weeks because it was too cold <laughs> to release it but it was oh. a wasp so it was imprisoned in a pyrex loaf pan oh it was my a very God. strange thing it was but so on mad. a one day we did release it yeah but <laughs> it, at the same time to have set it outside would have been to condemn it to immediate death absolutely and now we go to christine Murray. thank oh. you so much Carl. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on to Christine Murray. Uh, I'm going to change everybody's status and start Christine's video. I think you should be, hey. there you are. Hello. Okay. Hi. <laughs> uh, so Christine, you're probably the youngest of our of our panelists. Yes. Um, and uh, in addition to the, uh, the, the slides that you sent me, I did actually grab a couple of pages from uh, Diary of a Tokyo Teen. Oh that my God. Seemed, okay. <laughs> don't be embarrassed. That seemed to address uh, kind of notions of identity. Yeah. Um, I still can't hear you, which is extremely depressing. Um, it's, not, it's not you, apparently it's me. Um, I couldn't hear any of what Laura said, uh, uh, and, and I can't hear you. So please just just chime in <laughs> where <laughs> where you want to comment on uh, what what you're seeing on the screen. Um, I'm I'm imagining the first few images are from the upcoming graphic novel that you're working on. Yeah. Um... I guess my, I, I hope people can hear me. I'm sorry. We can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, my, I guess it's kind of funny, but you know, when people ask like when I started drawing comics and why I started drawing comics, like the comics you see on the screen right now that, um, you know, that I've been posting on Instagram and I started posting them on Instagram about two years ago when I was uh, still in college because um, I graduated not too long ago, like I graduated two years ago. Um, but 
uh, they asked me like, why is there a drawing comics? I was like, well, if you kind of look at the beginning of my comics, I kind of feel like what kind of kickstarted this journey was, uh, I was having like an identity crisis and um, it was, um, you, um, you know, sorry. I'm, I'm half Japanese and um, half white. So my, my father is white and my mother is Asian. And um, I had a, a interesting childhood where I was, I was born in Tokyo, but I moved to the US when I was young and you know, I was raised in the United States and I kind of feel like that really um, impacted the way I perceived myself and, you know, grew to understand my identity. Um, and when I was in college, I, you know, I was inspired by this, you know, desire to discover more of my Japanese identity to uh, move to Tokyo and to live there for a year. And uh, and so a lot of my comics are about um, this experience and just um, you know the my uh, the way that people have perceived my identity while living in the United States in comparison to Japan and um, I guess one of the things that was kind of like funny or that was unexpected about my time. Uh, living in Japan was that, you know, I came to Japan with this expectation that um, people would, people would, um, or I guess to start when I was, you know, growing up in the United States, I grew up in a very, um, a very predominantly white, you know, suburb. And I was one of, I was the only um, student, you know, of Asian descent at my school. And so, you know, I guess the experience of um, growing up in the U.S. and people always, you know, like perceiving me as, um, you know, East Asian and having like uh, assumptions about me or like the type of person I am or um, what what I'm supposed to be like. Um, you know, I kind of like <laughs> grew up with that and yeah, feeling confused and oh now we're at Diary of a Tokyo Teen which is like a, which is kind of a 360 from my current works which are all black and white and a little bit heavier and darker but I guess that also reflects the different points I was at in my life where I actually wrote and drew Diary of a Tokyo Teen when I was 15 um, in high school and that was like my experience in Japan and as a high schooler and it was just like it wasn't, I wasn't even living there. It was like, I was spending a summer there with my family and, you know, I had this, you know, to, at that point in my life still, I was, you know, kind of like in a grass is greener on the other side of where like, oh, Japan is like the coolest <laughs> best place in the world. Like I want to live here. And I just like, you know, like, ah, like Japan, it's, you know, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, I certainly can. Like, I can't believe you threw these when you were 15. When I was 15, I was just messing around, like, doing nothing. I, I'm so, like, when uh, Hope, Hope Larson showed me your comics, um, The Diary of Tokyo Teen, so that's how I was introduced to you. So and I, I still just, can't hear, um, and I'm not I, sure if uh, it's time to move on. Christine, have we seen all your slides? Have we gotten to <laughs> Bob and the Monk? I think no. we'll we yeah uh, we've yes just yes up. or no I can't hear you <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm not quite sure what's going on here uh no not yet she was just going into the context Is it time of to being... go to Mary Naomi no not yet nope. okay so, so um, anyway I just I just wanted to so say you... that I was blown away and I'm very impressed with your um, that, that you were doing this at such a young age because I, I personally didn't come to these conclusions until I was like way in my 20s and even 30s so but continue sorry I didn't mean to <laughs> thank you sorry. yeah thank you um, so much this is so weird it means a lot yeah um but yeah so you know Diary of a Tokyo Teen is this very bright eyed view of Tokyo through my eyes when I was 15 and you know, I kind of carried that with me when I came back to Tokyo when I was in college. And, 
you know, again, like this journey of discovery, self-discovery. And, you know, I was really looking forward to kind of finally fitting in, in a place like Tokyo. And I just kind of, I kind of had that hope or a desire because growing up, you know, in the U.S., I always felt like people were just, you know, people as always, you know, asking questions about, you know, my identity or who I am. And I guess what I was really looking for was, ah, I just want to be in a place where people won't, you know, people won't ask me any questions. Like, let me just, <laughs> let me just exist. Let me, let me, um, right. let me live my life. And, but I guess the, the plot to, it's not the plot, like the kind of the shock that I wasn't expecting was I almost had the same experience in Tokyo where, you know, in kind of the reverse, people were asking questions because they could tell that I was not fully Japanese. And so again, I found my identity kind of being, I don't know, questioned or just, you know, just this feeling of um, kind of not being not quiet, not quiet enough. Um, and so that kind of is why I started drawing uh, comics and sharing them to Instagram was because I was, I don't know, it was just my way of processing all of these um, experiences and emotions and trying to understand myself better. So I hope I didn't take up too, I hope I didn't talk too long. <laughs> no, that was, thanks for sharing the history. And I also can't believe also, you did this at 15. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's incredibly <laughs> impressive. Um, and now I, we're going to move on to Mara Naomi, who I, I hope we can uh, get her her bio up on the on the screen because she has is not only an extraordinary cartoonist, but she is an extraordinary kind of activist and uh, and and spokesperson, I guess, for um, for cartoonists who have perhaps been marginalized. She's uh, the creator and data and administrator of three different databases: cartoonists of color, queer cartoonists, and disabled cartoonists, um, which are our databases that I go to with some frequency when I want to make sure that I'm not leaving out an obvious person for a, a given panel. Um, so I'm going to start going through um, Mari Naomi's uh, uh, slides. Uh, the first one is, <laughs> hold on, let me make sure that Mari Naomi is visible. Start video. I'm going to, there we go. It'd be really funny if I were picking my nose when the video Mari, can, on. Uh, Mari, can you start your video? Uh, it should be on. Uh, I believe it was already on. Can other folks besides me see Mara Naomi? Shit. Because right now I don't feel like I can trust oh, my, my experience at all. Uh, it won't let no. me start the video. Am I on there? Not yet for me. So Mara Naomi, the first slide that I have up for you is, I, oh, I'm gonna go. get this probably wrong. It's, there you are. It's either um, goth Asian punks or Asian goth punks. Asian goth punks. <laughs> Asian <rule> goth punks. <laughs> <laughs> and how far back does this go? Is this uh is this early? So this is new, um, and it's it's not auto bio. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm just going to answer. Uh, this is. I started this comic because I thought, you know, who's underrepresented in media and who I'd really like to see is the alternative people of color and like, and friendships that are platonic and like queer kids in the eighties, because, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the queer kids in the eighties, let's be honest, were in the closet, but, um, but they were there, uh, we were there. And uh, so this is not strictly auto bio, but a lot of the stories are based on things that did happen to me or my friends. Um, now we're on to, to the beginning page of turning Japanese, which is 
uh, kind of similar in theme to what Christine Mari is doing about uh, how at, at a much older age, I started re realizing that I wanted to connect with my Asian side because I'd always felt like an outsider as a kid um, who also grew up in a white suburb. And uh, I, I thought I would try to connect with that part of my heritage, thinking that I would be welcome in with open arms and uh, kind of how I thought <laughs> it would be when I came out as bisexual. I'm like, oh, all the queers are going to love me, but that's not really how it works. <laughs> So yeah, um, there, there, it is. It is interesting being Asian American and just living in a liminal space. Um, I personally don't speak fluent Japanese, and um, this book, Turning Japanese, is a lot about uh, learning another language. So people who don't, who aren't multiracial or don't have that experience, who have tried to learn another language have identified with this book, which I didn't expect when I wrote it, but it's kind of cool. Um, so a lot of it's about language. A lot of it, of it is about like culture. A lot of it is just my life and the weird crap I did in my twenties. Um, and what I, I mean, and also it's about when I went to Japan looking for my heritage and I thought I would learn the language and the culture by working at hostess bars. Um, which I would not, I would not recommend doing that as a way to find yourself, but it was um, certainly a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, here we have um, me kind of making fun of all the Asian cult, oh. like uh, media in the US that I kind of grew up with. Um, and I feel like only recently started to change, honestly, like it's, it was, it's only recently that I don't, I'm not afraid to watch something with an Asian actor in it because I don't think that they're going to get um, stereotyped or something, although it still happens. Um, and here's a mural I made uh, that's up, actually it's, it's, it's in several places in Los Angeles right now uh, that I did earlier this year about kind of being afraid to leave the house and, and kind of psyching myself to get up and out and uh, all these things can be found on my website. These are these are actually surprises, but um, what Karen chose to add to the slideshow. So I don't know what's next. It could be anything. Oh my gosh, it's a diary comic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is actually, so, so I do these diary comics on Patreon. Uh, I do them every day and I post them once a week and uh, just, uh, just a little snapshot of each day. I've been getting really experimental with them. So I'm like really into collage and just playing around. Uh, and honestly, procre uh, not pro uh, my diary comics and, and especially on Patreon is where I'm doing all of my experimentation right now. Like all the crazy stuff that I don't feel is necessarily appropriate or that the world is necessarily ready for and other mediums um, are, getting done here and I'm working out like how, you know, what my style is going towards next, what I'm doing next, um, just artistically. So if you're, you're into that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And it's also, it's a snapshot of things that I'm doing every day. So yeah, what's next? Oh my God. It could be anything. <laughs> Uh, but I've been making comics since 1997. My first comic was published in 1998. So I'm, uh, I've been around for a while and I don't, and, and, and you can see from the selection style has been constantly changing. I'd like to say evolving, but I don't really think that's true. I think sometimes it gets worse and sometimes <laughs> it gets better. Um, but that's kind of the fun of being creative is just goofing around. Um, and I like to keep it fun. So yeah, what's next? <laughs> That's my friend Yumi Sakagawa saying that. Oh, uh, here's another diary comic. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard some kind of stereotype about half Japanese girls, but man, I was pretty pissed when I heard this one. What do they say about half Japanese yeah. girls? <laughs> I don't know, but whatever it is, is racist because you should It's say not going to be a good thing. Yeah. It's not... <laughs> yeah, I shot that That down. it's weird to try to make <laughs> metrics of racial makeups. Uh, right. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Um, 
here's one from uh, yeah another diary comic um I, I i've been kind of playing around with this idea of me as a ghost in a space or just like a, not a ghost but like movement like here i am temporarily i'm drawing myself here um so this is from September. Wow, I feel like I've grown a lot since September as an artist, <laughs> just because I've been trying so many different things. It's weird. Um, I love this photo yeah. technique. Oh, thanks. Uh, it's it's really fun. Oh, and here's an old diary comic. And by old, I mean like a year ago. Oh my God, year and a half. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, me trying to go out and get groceries for my friends, my two Asian friends who had colds. And I'm like, I don't want them to get you know, hate crimes when they go out and try to buy groceries. Uh, but I'll never do that again in the beginning of a pandemic. Like not, it was insane. <laughs> not that good of a friend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, pandemic. Uh, oh yeah. This is... <laughs> I was, yeah, I was in a Whole Foods and I'm like, what the heck? Like, <laughs> what is Asian? Uh, here I am by me at Whole Foods. Um, it's goofy. Sometimes I don't know what I'm gonna write about that day, but I just, yeah, I have fun with it. Um, the Asian aisle in France, like the products offered feel like a hate crime because they're really bad. <laughs> oh yeah, what I, like what? <laughs> Uh, it's just usually like, it'll be like Korean tonkatsu, pork, noodle, like just things that don't exist, like made up stuff. And <laughs> it's just like, um, I, I don't know, like it, it's because they have their own culture. I will send you pictures, but, um, yeah, there are some times where I'm like, this is a hate crime. <laughs> so it feels really like a microaggression, certainly. Um, yeah, tonkatsu. I mean, is that like when you go to a Japanese restaurant, but you find out it's run by... Korean people like I don't a thing I've seen here is Japanese restaurants with a panda as their logo and it's like famously only China has pandas that's kind of the whole thing <laughs> so that's I like mean, a really weird I think there's a Japanese I, zoo that has a panda but I think they import it's a traveling panda <laughs> as a gift as a gift <laughs> right it, it's not like a native like panda that's um, like if they did a United States uh, uh, logo and it's like a giraffe. I mean, we have them in zoos. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I don't know. It's, it's weird being in another culture and just having to like acclimate like <laughs> what is happening here. I mean, part of the reason that I was, um, we should somehow get everyone back on video because I'm just feeling very self-conscious here. Uh, but I was, I was very interested in, <laughs> all of your views about like, I mean, like how you've experienced being Asian in the pandemic, you know, with, with, all, with so much anti-Asian sentiment going around, but like Laura, I feel like your, your point of view, like being in France was really interesting when we talked about it. And um, I don't know, that's kind of partly why I was like, oh, let's invite Laura. Like, like I really think you have a unique it's point odd. of view. I I, I'm I'm in like a really rural area so not only am I like the only American I'm like also like just like one of I you know it's you can't tell by looking I'm just really kind of one of the few only like non-white people around and the whole time even at the start of the pandemic I mean like which was just not cool where people were there was a lot of laughing about like oh China's really messed up and they're eating weird things, which felt weird because in France, I'm like, because you do eat weird things. I'm like, <laughs> you eat weird things. And there's lots of comments about how China is dirty. And I see French people doing sketchy things all the time. I'm like, that's you. Like, you're the, like, why is this the stereotype? And then seeing it come over. But I was just really self-conscious of, because in general here, people do treat me as American, which is wild. Like, just right off the bat, no questions about things. But at the start of the pandemic, because it was so associated with East Asian people, and historically in my life, people have not been able to tell that I'm not Chinese. And so I was just like, I had a flu at the start of the pandemic, and I was just openly sanitizing my hands and wearing a mask because I did not want anyone to think that I was spreading it because it really wasn't in France at that point. And I think... I had a lot of performance anxiety of showing that I was extra clean. It's internalized stuff. Like 
I don't know the why I feel the need to demonstrate that I'm clean um, yeah. and that I'm being a good citizen. And then seeing what was happening in America and also the politics and knowing that it's like, uh, there are people with prejudices who didn't need any extra ammunition and just thinking like, this is like the, the speech is gonna turn to acts and it's gonna be bad. I did not expect that they would um, target the elderly, which seems especially shitty and is um, a particularly, I think, Asian American thing. If you're first generation, you have parents where you've been their navigator of America. So I think there was a lot of, I think if you're a child of an immigrant, sometimes you're trying to protect your parent from um things that they don't really notice. Like I wouldn't say my mom is the most alert to when she's being profiled or being handed racism. She doesn't, she just thinks people are treating her stupid but she doesn't quite understand why. And as someone born here, I do understand why. So that was another really confusing element. Um, yeah, and it, it's just, it's just strange. Like it, I've spent like a couple years in France feeling very American and it was just interesting being treated that way. And then having to kind of switch and feel like, okay, but if we're just going on faces and I don't have a chance to talk, should I be acting like a very clean East Asian person? I don't know. I felt nervous about uh, wearing masks because before people were wearing masks around here before there were any mandates I was like I mean I've always worn not always but for since since I was a teenager and first saw it in Japan I'm like oh that's a really good idea and I would wear masks like if, if uh, I was I don't know on an airplane or whatever and all my friends like to make fun of me for it and you know whatever oh you're paranoid but like it's I think it's a good practice and um, or if I had a cold and I was going to be around people. And then when the pandemic started and no one was wearing masks, like I just wanted to wear masks, but, um, and, and some of my fellow Asian friends did too, but were scared of getting hate crimed um, and, or people thinking, oh, well, they're dirty. So they have to wear a mask. But I was just, I was trying to protect myself from all of you guys, <laughs> not you guys, but you know, the white people. <laughs> One of the Is things everyone that- Everyone um... here in a major city, um, Connie and Christine, are you both in big cities? Yes. And yeah. I was still in Tokyo when the pandemic began. So oh. it was kind of interesting. And how was I, that? And I was I was in Tokyo, you know, when I began hearing about like anti-Asian hate crimes. And um, you know, it's kind of like I feel a bit sad, but like the first thing I thought was just like. I felt relief that my grandparents like live in Japan and are in Japan and I'm like they'll never have to I don't have to worry about that or like they won't have to experience that um but you know it's it was tragic to think that you know other people don't have that you know they don't have that luxury or like you know their family is not you know in they're you know in another country where like they don't have to worry about that and I was the exact same way with my parents I'm like thank god you're there stay there and they did yeah <laughs> stay there <laughs> yeah and I actually but I made the decision to return to the U.S. Um, during the pandemic and so it was also kind of like a weird uh, like feeling of like you know, I mean, I've been fortunate for most of my life, you know, to not really experience, you know, aggressive, you know, like hatred or racism, but then like this, um, you know, the, these, these hate crimes and like people, it's become so, you know, like prevalent, um, you know, during the pandemic and to think about that. And, you know, it was kind of like the first time I had to really think like, when I was about to go back to the US, like, is this like a real like possibility or like this can, yeah. this can happen to me, this can happen to my friends or my family. Um, and it really made me, um, it made me just think, just think a lot about different things. And especially, you know, even the way I understand myself because, 
you know, for a long time, and I, I drew a comic about this, but for a long time, I didn't even know if I was, you know, the word and the label Asian American began to become so used in the news. And I was like, oh, like Asian American, you know, it was kind of weird, but growing up, like for, for a while, I didn't even know if I was allowed to call myself Asian American um, because, you know, if I've had, I had experiences where, you know, well, people hear different narratives, you know, and sometimes that, that word, you know, it can be very broad, but they're, you know, narratives that people commonly hear. So people, you know, have told me, oh, you're, maybe you're not, you're not Asian American because, you know, one of your parents is, you know, is white. So if you're not fully Asian and it, it but so it was really, um, you know, which gets very really messed up. And <laughs> thing, you know, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it can be a confusing process for anybody to find like a way to, you know, describe or label themselves. But yeah. People always wanted to want to tell you what you're, you are allowed to be and what you're not allowed to be. And it, it's, that's never going to change. It's, it's all about what you decide that you're going to be and like yeah. how I think self-identify is such a powerful thing. And the older I get, the more I realize, you know, I'm going to call myself queer because that's how I feel. And that's, you know, how I am, but there's definitely people who said, I'm not Asian enough. I'm not queer enough. I'm not whatever. And I'm like, okay, I don't fit anywhere. So I'm just going to fit where I want to fit. That's what you got to do. That's not Asian enough thing. I love reading that because like, I remember having those thoughts and being like, these are insane thoughts. Like, it's just <laughs> um, like, cause what do, it, it just is so abstract. Like, what does that mean? And I was raised not speaking Korean because um, my mom didn't want us to have an accent <laughs> and um, that's not quite how it works. And now I feel it's unfortunate not to share the main language, the language she probably thinks in and has a really deep connection. And um, and it was weird because I think there was this, this, there's some idea when you immigrate that your kid is just going to be integrated into the land. But there's a unique thing about Asians where it really like how you present in the world comes into it so deeply. And I think as a kid, I just didn't realize like, why is everyone mentioning my face? And, you know, the typical, I'm not going to do it, like the gestures and just not understanding what factor that was playing and then not wanting it to be a factor and then just learning to in, like resolve your own identity because it's just it, Asian American identity can be odd and I'm speaking of like as an East Asian because I think it's different if you're brown yeah. um, but it's just like I've had friends that I mean now I think of it as kind of a microaggression who say you're basically white and I remember at times kind of smiling and being like okay and really unpacking that one I don't know what that means but just it, we, we occupy kind of a, an interesting phase and we get spoken about in a group all all the you know what that happens to every group but I remember the you know one of the good the good immigration story the model minority thing was the one I grew up in and it was strange because um my family was so it just also didn't seem to this kind of prosperity whiz kid thing did not seem to apply to us and um, a lack of cultural mirrors um, that just I don't know it's a really dissociative thing I find it a really great community now um, but uh, but I, I like that so many people here had to resolve how they felt about an identity that basically was being told to them like these are your things yeah. this is who you are and then trying to decide and embrace different parts and figure that out i love what you just said about um Funny, cultural break for a second if i can um just to say uh first of all for the audience um if you have questions for our panelists please use the q a button which you should see on your screen um, because in about 10 minutes or so, I'd like to open it up to questions from, from our attendees. Uh, and uh, I wanna get back to what Connie was about to say, but I also want to say that some of you addressed uh, questions of not completely, and this may be a, a consequence simply of what slides you sent. Some of you addressed uh, issues of um, 
uh, not really relating to the identity that that you are perceived as, or that you are uh, the, the cultural heritage that you were born into, not really getting to it perhaps in any other way than food, which I totally got. My mom always called me a stomach Jew. Um, and some of you uh, really dealt with the, the anti-Asian American hate of the pandemic, and some of you didn't. So I'm wondering, for those of you who didn't go into those those areas, is that something you are still exploring and didn't share in this case, or um, or is it just something that that you're not exploring at all at this point? And now I'm going to shut up and let Connie speak. I'm so sorry, Connie. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. This is a lot. There's a lot to unpack here. And I just wanted to go back to what, what um, Laura was talking about, which is having that cultural mirror, because I think that um, the term Asian American is definitely like shape shifting. Um, it has throughout history and it has like in an accelerated way um, during the pandemic. Um, you know, so you, you've mentioned so many things about um, you know, sort of your experience of being Asian in the pandemic. And I think that we've all been forced to, to grapple with that, like collectively, which is, which um, in my lifetime, I've not experienced before, um, where everybody is just like, whoa, like, it's like spotlight on this term and how problematic it is and how diverse it is and how multifaceted. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to, I, I just wanted to echo that, you know, like, I, I appreciate, like, that you're all kind of coming to this from, you know, like, in a very personal way, and what's different about this, you know, period of history, um, um, for me, is that it's like this collective experience, um, and when I first, when I first, you know, like, it's, it's something that, you know, being Chinese American, my parents are from Taiwan, um, you know, um, like it's, it's, I've always been hypersensitive that I am different, but, and, and I don't really know like the cultural norms of like either cultural, either culture with mastery, even though like I speak both languages and, you know, like I always feel a little bit out of place. Um, but I, I think, um, I think in this moment, you know, like I'm sort of, sorry, I'm sort of going off on a tangent right now, but just that the question of identity was never far from my mind growing up. And then during, you know, as soon as, as soon as Trump said China virus, like before any of this happened, like my spidey sense like went up and I was just like, whoa, like I, like, I know this is coming. Like, I've, I've had, like, the anxiety for the last 20 years that America is going to turn on all Asians. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's, like, Absolutely. you know what I mean? Like, I, like, it's, it, it, so none of this is a surprise. Um, and... I mean, it wasn't the first time that we've been turned against. If you exactly. Look, historically, like, it's exactly. just a matter of time. Connie, I was interested in your experience um, in New York City. Um, I know, like, I was actually surprised that Christine was in Tokyo, yeah. and of course, Laura's in France. I was in Los Angeles. Like, what was it like? I like, I, I loved your comics that you were making about that that time. I was like, oh my god, this is so annoyingly relatable. <laughs> but like, did you did you um, experience any kind of like it was like was it mostly internal or was it like were there external factors? Like I got I had external people like white people who were like openly hostile towards me when it all started. And I was wondering if it was the same there. It was tense. There were several, you know, weeks where, you know, like most most people I knew if they, you know, if they could um if they could help it, they would just not leave their, you know, their apartments. So um, that was definitely um, how I coped, which was I went like very like inside, you know, like it became like a different world where you're just like, okay, I'm not going to go out at night. Like as soon as it's after dark, it's like, that's my curfew as an Asian person right now. Um, and so it was just like, it was incredibly tense. And um, also speaking to what Laura was saying before, how um, a lot of these hate crimes targeted elderly people. You know, like this is this is like, you know, the the period when, you know, for my parents in Los Angeles, like I was just, you know, we were having more conversations about racism and being Asian in America than 
ever before in my life. Like th these were conversations where there were no openings for me to discuss this growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you know, sadly, but also, you know, like on the flip end of that, it's just, there was an opera, there was suddenly like a window. It was a very sad window, but it was a window in which, you know, like, you know, I was, you know, talking to my parents and like, literally like, like we're translating stuff like on the fly, like, oh, I don't know how to say this. And, you know, I don't know how to say like white supremacy, like in Chinese. So let me look that up. And then, you know, but it's like happening in real time, you know? And so, um, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's intense. And um, to, you know, what Karen was just asking, you know, like about our decision to, to make comics about this or not address it directly, you know, I think that I think that that's you know everyone's choice, um, and there's no like we're, there's no like um, obligation for any of us to you know. To I felt differently. I felt like it was an obligation because none of my white friends seem to take me seriously when I'm like I'm scared to leave the house. They're like, oh, hey, have you watched the show? I'm like, you're not listening to me. Like, yeah, I, it, it was really, it was really. I don't talk about race with my white friends a ton um, because it's infuriating. Um, not, you know, not, not that they're not like good people, but it's just really hard to explain that. Like just talking about heterosexual versus bisexual, queer, whatever, like to to people who've never just been around that. It's just, it, it, it could be really a that's lot. A, that's a lot of responsibility though. So like, <laughs> not to say that we shouldn't, but I don't think like, like, I think the pressure, it's a lot of pressure. Oh, yeah, to have to do it. Like, I, oh, I think yeah. we if we feel compelled, you know, I, I ended up, you know, addressing it directly, like in real time. But, you know, it was just like, that was a decision. Yeah, um, where I was just like, okay, like, if nobody else is doing this, then, you know, like I do. So I so I, I think we're on the same page, like, I definitely felt that. But then why do we need to, you know, prove to the people around us you know, that we're clean, you know, like washing our hands and being sanitary, you know, or like constantly like defending our identity. Like, so my ideal is that we don't need to, we don't need to address it directly, but the reality is that the representation is not there. And so like all of a sudden we are, you know, like responsible for, you know, like sort of carrying the torch of what, you know, being Asian means to us. Yeah. There's so some I, sort of internal community building also, though, because like I think um, talking about the subjects and being able to relate to like the real feel fear of it. And I do. I mean, I don't think I really talked about because I'm still sorting out like I live in France now and it's like, what even am I like? I I don't know. Like um, and I actually I feel even more Asian American because I'm like those are two very big parts of my identity um and trying to explain to people here what that means which is just like I hold both like essentially and but it also means like I'm just in like you don't really have a homeland I think that's kind of the experience of being in in America when you have immigrant parents that um it's interesting to hear some people went to Japan and were like I'm back guys. And cause I, for me, I've never thought that that would fly for me. I never thought I could just land in Korea and be like, I'm back. Um, cause I just feel both so equally. Um, I, I, think I mean, it was a lie. Like, good. Nobody's back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, and I think that's the interesting thing. Cause this is a panel of Asian Americans and, um, creating the media, especially not growing up having that and not seeing a mirror and it's like do I exist am I wrong because there doesn't seem to be something that is mirroring my experience so trying to like square peg in a round hole figure out where you're supposed to go and I think that's why um having a diversity of media and the thing about comics comics um for me comes out of a lot of zine culture where you can immediately go to press and create culture and so absolutely it should be, you know, um, a, um, just a minority playground. I don't mean that that way, but it's just, it's a really powerful way that, um, to create media. Um, 
And I wonder if it will be different to people being able to relate and just see like, oh, this is where this is where my identity fits in. Because without mirroring, it is like you don't exist or you're doing it wrong and you yeah. should exist in a different model. And um, and it, it is interesting because Asian American is such a humongously broad term. It's insane. Um, I think if you went to Asia and told them like, that's what they're doing in America, they would be like, that doesn't even make sense. Like, some of these countries are enemies. Yeah. Right. And, right? Um, <laughs> but um, I, I mean, for me, it's like, it's nice because then you have this like big pan Asian community in America because there's not a reason. It's not like Asia is like, go Asia. And by that, we mean all of the, I mean, it's ridiculous. So <laughs> big landmass. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question from one of our attendees who's pointing out that um, we had kind of a, a, a horrible cocktail of hatred in America where we had the, the anti-Asian hatred that stemmed from the pandemic and then the anti-Black hatred that stemmed from the Black Lives Matter movement um, and, and assorted protests. And uh, the, the questioner um, felt that uh, conversations about race, and I realize we've kind of gotten off comics, but I feel like this is more important, um, that conversations about race almost had to differentiate between anti-Asian and anti-Black racism. And uh, they're asking, do you feel similarly? Did you feel, uh, how did issues of kind of intersectionality and solidarity come up in conversations you were having? It's all white well, supremacy. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, I, like, uh, but I think um, it plays out in very different ways, which I felt like there were a lot of conversations about that and how to reckon both of those things. And I'm gonna pass to Christine. <laughs> Jump in. Um, yeah, this is such, I guess, um, one of the things that I think both situations made me think about, especially in my personal experience of being, you know, half white and half, half Asian, it's really made me think about, like, you know, the privilege, like, white, white privilege, and, you know, in a way, I kind of felt like, you know, I mean, visually, I appear East Asian, but, you know, my father is white, and, I feel like, you know, it's a different experience and, you know, with um, anti-Asian racism even, I had that privilege of, you know, you know, fearing for, you know, my mother, my siblings, but then also this, this sounds, I mean, this, is, this sounds horrible that I have to think this, but this reassurance that if my father is with them, like maybe they'll, they, they won't be bothered because he is white and he is a white male and, you know, they, they won't be bothered. Um, and naturally, you know, with anti-Black racism as well, you know, there is obviously the, the question of white privilege comes again. And, you know, I think it is important, as, as Lexus said, you know, to kind of see that they were both happening, but there are, you know, different experiences as well. And, you know, to really, I truly really think about that. Um, yeah, it, sorry, it's, it's a lot. I, I'll stop talking now. Yeah, I mean, it sucks that we have to have uh, chaperones sometimes. Like I was afraid to leave the house after I got spit at. Uh, in my old neighborhood and I wouldn't go out alone. I'd take my white husband with me because that's how I felt safe. So. Yeah. There were some good conversations. I know that um, the conversations about policing and about how not to turn to policing in order to make Chinatown and the elderly more safe. And I liked that everything was weaving together. Like there were a lot of, I think, especially in um, maybe the Bay Area, they were like, let's get together community groups because let's not like, let's not try to protect our community with a tool that is harming another. 
And I think that was unifying. And like, rather than just being like, we need to address our community. It's like, we need to address the thing that makes all our communities um, unsafe. And that was really um, inspiring. I don't know. It's been like a horrible time, but I feel like the conversations being had were not had before. And um, I hope they're building something more secure for everyone. Yeah, I, I'm oh. very encouraged by um, the level of awareness, um, particularly among younger generations who um, who maybe maybe have more um, exposure to you know uh, sort of more diversity of like representation. Um, I think that the movements and the intersections are very related um, back to um, Lexus's um, question. Um, you know, I think the whole, I think, I think the like Asian American kind of, um, you know, umbrella term and, you know, sort of movement owes everything to, you know, the um, civil rights movement, you know, like that, that it was, it was at that, you know, sort of like, that moment uh, in American history in the 1960s that you know these these um, hyphenated terms like came to be. So there's a lot of history. There's we have a very dark history in this country, but it, you know from the civil rights movement was also you know like what came out of that was a sense of like we're stronger together. You know as um, as um, Mari Naomi's mural beautifully, you know, reminds us of. It's it's something that I think we're always, there's always tension around. And I think we're still trying to figure out the language, you know, um, to, to better understand and figure out these dynamics. So it's it's very complex, but I think they're very related. There's no Asian American without you know, black or Hispanic or, you know, like indigenous, you know, it's like there's, we're, you know, in being the experience of being a person of color in this country for all its, you know, fraught history (laughs) um, is, um, is always like an undercurrent, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we speak it or not. So what I, so back to like, what I find encouraging is, um, you know, in this moment, there's more conversation, there's more community building, you know, we're actually talking about it. You know, I feel like 15 years ago, nobody was saying like white supremacy casually. And now it's like an everyday term because we're like, oh, this is, this is kind of how we live, you know? I have another, yeah, I feel, oh, can I, can I answer also? Of course. Oh, I just, um, I, like, I, I feel like I didn't, like, I, if I look back on my life before the pandemic, there were definitely just thousands of microaggressions and I definitely experienced racism. But I think for a long time I was in denial because I didn't want to be um, singled out. I didn't want to experience uh, racism. So I kind of wrote it off. I'm like, oh, that wasn't racism. That's just them joking around or that's whatever. Um, and uh, And over time, I kind of got like, it took until my 40s, I think, where I was really like, oh, yeah, that was really messed up. And, uh, you know, but meanwhile, like, I was very aware of racism against the Black people I knew. And, uh, and so I'm like, okay, well, that's racism. But my racism, that's not really racism. Um, and uh, I think when the pandemic started, and I started experiencing open hostility and like straight out racism, I think that kind of made me kind of opened my eyes to like, oh, wow, yeah, that was really messed up. And it just made me, I mean, not that I wasn't already protective of my Black, the Black people I know and friends and, you know, whatever. I just feel like that made me even more protective. I'm like, yeah, we got to cut out this white supremacy shit. Like that, that, I mean, that's kind of, it just made me more protective and uh, and it made me more more aware of the privilege I'd had up to then. Even you know, even though it also made me more aware of the racism that I experienced. It's very complicated. There's a lot of nuance in this, um, but I do think that yeah, we have so far to go. Even though like things are getting better, but not like we have so far to go. Like in the 90s and 80s, 2021, like, it should be better than this. I mean, right? 
But like at the time you always want to, you know, not always, but like some of us want to be optimistic and say, oh, we're, we've come so far. And I, I was like that in the eighties and nineties. I'm like, oh, we've come so far. We can <laughs> vote. Like women can vote. This is amazing. Oh, it was really bad to be around in the lot, you know, before, but now it's great. And now I'm like, oh yeah, the eighties suck. The nineties suck. Wait, I think now sucks. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that it's kind of opening my eyes to history really. Like, and, and that's, horrible and wonderful and when I made that uh the mural I, I was definitely reading up about like the history of racism against Asians in the U.S. and also how uh, for the longest time Asian Americans and Black people have supported each other in ways that I wasn't aware of before and I, I'm like oh yeah we're doing it now but did we do it then but yeah like this is this is a, a history and I think um I want to know more and I want, I want that to be more mainstream. I want people to talk about that. They didn't talk about that in school. Like I didn't know about the, the Chinese massacre. That was new. I like, I didn't know that happened in Los Angeles. Like that's crazy. Like, and I, I didn't hear remember. about internment camps in school. Oh. I don't think so. I don't yeah. think they covered a Japanese internment in school. Definitely not. Um, didn't learn about Vincent Chin in school. Like, I mean, I don't know. Shout yeah, out no, I mean, nor did, yeah, nor did I. So this is like, you know, this is the curriculum that we grew up with. Um, and yeah, so, so I think that, I think that these stories are surfacing more, you know, not everywhere, but, you know, with, um, you know, with the internet and like, you know, just the, um, the sort of, I guess, spreading out of like, who gets to, uh, create culture yeah. you know, before it was just like you know you have like you know maybe like five creators of culture and that was it and that was all we got and now you know like I love what Laura was saying before about like how comics is like a really direct way to create culture um, and you know there I think that it's not even limited to comics as a medium like it is it is um you know, very powerful, but so many people are finding ways to express themselves, like through whatever medium. Um, and, and that is, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's encouraging, um, even though, like, I wish I got it earlier. <laughs> so that's where we're running out of time. Um, we have some more questions in the Q and A, and I think we're only going to have time for one of them. And uh, I, I, I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing your your answer to this one. Uh, they write that um, growing up, they didn't realize that there even could be Asian American artists. Uh, they thought, and their parents thought, that only entitled white Americans could be artists. Um, so. Uh, Growing up, uh, going to school, they thought they needed to have like a respectable model minority sort of job. So they're wondering if any of you can talk about your journeys towards coming into your sense of self as an artist, as opposed to following other career paths. Can I, can I head this one off? I think I was lucky <laughs> uh, to have a white dad because I think I inherited some of his entitlement. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> And also I was um, a young punk. So I'm like, I could do anything. Screw everybody. I don't have to finish school. I'm just going to be an artist. Ah! And I did it. <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm, well, I, I had a, a great three semesters of college before I dropped out because it was too expensive. But um, so I would really like to oddly credit public schools with encouraging me and telling me I could be an artist um, and that I was an artist. And so I really don't, you know, encourage all kids who are creative, just splash it on them, because I think I really fed off that encouragement. I was told so often that I was very good at it, and I could do it, and um, I think I was just used to feeling like I wasn't going to be going towards what I saw, like a gathering of people like me. Um, I grew up like drawing a lot and also in a lot of comic shops, which were a very male space, and then in record shops, also a male space, and so I just, I think that per, I particularly did not need to see people like me to feel welcomed in. I just assumed you had to kind of shove your way in and that's how it was. Um, and I don't think it should be that way. Um, but um, as far as like getting a traditional job, like um, 
I think I was just really dead set on making art, my own feelings of worthiness, that's aside, but just the fact that <laughs> of doing it and feeling like, um, especially coming out of zines where it's just like, people put together zines in a matter of a day. It, it just really felt like you were allowed to do that, no problem. Um, and so I think I felt okay about that. I don't know how I managed to sidestep the family pressure, but I think I just, I just felt like there's no way the family's hope rely on me. Like this, it's not the, the one to bet on. So, um, cause I have a sibling, Christine. <laughs> um, well, I am, I'm very fortunate. My parents have, you know, been really supportive of my art and kind of like Mari said, my dad is, <laughs> my, <laughs> no, I, I can definitely benefit from, um, <laughs> my dad but uh I guess one of the things that I kind of related to in the uh, this question is you know you know growing up I I you know I, I don't think I was really exposed to a lot of you know Asian Americans like in the art space or specifically in the space of like telling stories and you know illustrating pictures and um so you know I guess I guess one scenario I'm thinking of was, you know, in elementary school growing up, there was one book that was by an Asian American female author. And um, I'm blanking on her name, but the book is The Year of the Dog. And so it was a, a, uh, yeah, and was, she's Chinese American author and it's about her, you know, experience with Chinese New Year and, you know, had like her cute illustrations. And I was like obsessed with this book because it was the closest thing I could get to feeling like seen and like understood in a way. Um, because, you know, she talked about her experiences of not being uh, fully fluent in Chinese. And I could understand that feeling because I'm not fully fluent in Japanese. And yes, The Year of the Dog by Grace Lynn. Thank you. I loved that book growing up. But, you know, I also always had that feeling of, you know, I love this book. I love this story, this author, but, you know, there's no, there's no story out there. That's like, that will always be, you know, that wasn't about a, you know, half Japanese, like protagonist. In fact, the first book I ever read that had, you know, a half Japanese, like protagonist was turning Japanese by Mari Naomi. What? <laughs> no, oh no, that was like the first time that I read a, you know, a comic, like a graphic novel specifically as well, you know, that was about oh. the experience of being half Japanese. And it was <laughs> so um, impactful because like, I mean, I, I like you already know, but like, I was just like, oh, like, you know, maybe I can do it too. That <laughs> kind of thing. Um, Sorry, I'm not trying to sound corny, but it's actually true. Um, you know, that feeling of encouragement and feeling like, you know, I can tell my story. And I hope that, you know, other, you know, young Asian Americans growing up, you know, as the space is becoming more diverse and people are all sharing their experiences and stories, like they'll, they'll feel encouraged to, you know, express themselves as well. That's lovely. <laughs> It absolutely underscores the importance of diversity and inclusion and representation in the arts because, or in anything, uh, people see someone who's doing what they want to do, who looks and sounds like them, and it gives them that sense that they can do it. And that's, that's beautiful. I'm really... Do it. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm done>. <laughs> <laughs> Connie, I think for me, that was Adrian Tomine. Optic Nerve was an early influence. Oh, yeah. Well, there we go. On me. And the Connie. I don't know why I'm moderating. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think we need to have this moment. <laughs> that's, that's hard to follow. It's just like, it's downhill from here. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, I never quite had the courage to entertain becoming an artist, even though it was um, always my dream. Like, I think that if I allowed myself the space, um, I would have said, yeah, like for sure, you know, children's book illustrator is what I want to do. Like that, that was probably like my earliest dream. Um, but I had to not do that 
like in order to not like disappoint, you know, like expectations. Um, so my route was like, I'm going to do everything I can to like check the boxes. And then on the side, I'm going to do my art. So as you know, like I, you know, when I started, I was just like holding down a really like tough, you know, very demanding full-time job. Um, and, you know, it was, and it wasn't until after grad school, actually, that I let myself, you know, sort of explore this because like, it was like, I had to hit, you know, I had to do like, you know, like college grad school, you know, and get a full-time job before like I could entertain anything else. <laughs> so, and then it was just like on the side, you know, it was just like, oh, you know, like, I mean, I was full in my mind, I was fully there but I couldn't admit that to anybody around me because I was just like, well, you know, this is a thing that I do like, you know, as like my side thing, you know, I just do this thing. I get up in the morning and I draw some comics and it actually, like I had this like coming out moment with my parents like, <laughs> where one time, like, I, th I think I gave them like a, like a printed comic that I made as I was leaving uh, when, as I was saying goodbye at the airport, I was like, mom, dad, I have to tell you something. I'm an artist. <laughs> airport. <laughs> and then, yeah, well, because I was like, I can't be in a car with them and like discuss the, my career prospects at that moment. This is fairly early on in my cartooning where it's just like, I wasn't any good. You know, I had no idea where this was going to go. I was just like coming out to them. I was just like, look, this is, this is what I'm doing right now. And, um, and they've, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate. They, they are very supportive of me, but then also like Asian immigrant, you know, like they didn't have, they didn't have this privilege that I had. So they're always like, you know, you got to head your bets. You got to have some security. You got to like, you know, so, so um, for me, the answer was holding down a full-time job while I was trying to become a cartoonist. And it wasn't until, you know, um, a few years ago, sort of pre the great resignation, when I decided that I'm going to be full in, like I'm going to be all in on cartooning. Um, so, so I quit, um, you know, like a career path that I was like very heavily in, and then, and then I backed out and started over. And that's sort of the beginning of my story, which is just like a few, even though I've been, you know, doing daily comics for a while. Like um, it was only a few years ago where I was just like, I need to be all in on this in order to achieve, you know, my, my goals as a cartoonist. And my parents have been incredibly supportive um, while at the same time, not understanding what I'm doing. <laughs> it's funny because yeah. I never, I never thought I would be a cartoonist full time. Like that just wasn't even a possibility in my brain and until I think it was after my book came out in 2010 or 2011 and I just started getting all these really low paying but like a lot of jobs in comics and I'm like well should I quit my day job I can't do both like I just didn't have the the, the bandwidth to do both so I kind of I turned to my husband I'm like well would you rather be with a successful video game writer which is what I was doing before or do you want to be with a very poor cartoonist <laughs> and he's like you know why don't you try the cartooning stuff and uh you know I might go back to video games honestly like it's been a while it's been a good time but like I don't know it's good to have a day job on <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're telling me I mean I'm glad that I kept the day job for as long as I did but it's you know but it's also hard to get any good at what you're trying to do like it's hard. You know, if you're if you're divided um, but yeah, I, I admire, like, I mean, your all of your work, like, makes me want to cry, like, in a good way, but like, it makes me want, it makes me, you know, feel all the feelings of, like, at, you know, admiration, adoration, um, and then also, it's like, oh, I wish I could do that. <laughs> like, Can I just say, like, I know we don't have a lot of time here, and Connie, you keep putting down your early work, but I've been following you for a long time, and you were, like, out the gate, amazing. Yeah from the, like, from the beginning, like, you, and, and maybe it's because you started, like, when you were ready to become, like, you know, to get into this art thing, but, like, you, you've always felt very sincere, 
your art was always, I loved it. Like, and I love all of your work, every single one of you. And I'm just, I'm so excited to be on this panel with you guys. And, uh, but yeah, stop putting your early work down because oh, we all have early work and we all <laughs> think badly about it. I think badly about what I was doing in September. I mean, it's just part of the process. It <laughs> the is actually it is. really quick like the lifetime of like a raspberry or something like it's just a really fleet it's a weird thing to devote so much time to but and then sometimes it swings back where it's like it's not so bad but like the moment of like pure satisfaction for me is very fleeting but um the joy of making it is always there so i think it's the the actual act of creating it the the after effect is very complicated <laughs> folks we are in and we all hate our earlier work i'm so sorry uh there were other questions that were great um i i wish we could talk like this forever i never even got to my question <laughs> um, but i didn't want to interrupt because the the discussion was so wonderful so thank you to connie christine mary naomi and laura Thank you to Emily Sasso, who lent me her laptop so that I could hear. What was <laughs> um, and thank you to the attendees who were having an incredibly vigorous discussion in the chat, um, one of whom, Risa, posted a terrific link from July about Illinois becoming the first state to mandate Asian American history in the public school system. Wow. Aww. You know, Yay. thank you, Risa. <laughs> thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Audience, go out and buy these folks' books. They are all so incredibly talented and amazing, and we can't wait to see what comes next. So until next time, thank you. Thank all. you so much. Bye. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I see everyone. <laughs> that was what I knew we'd have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was great. I'm going to end the meeting, so I'm afraid. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bye, guys. I don't like hang out with you guys, but uh, another time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Karen. you so much, Karen. This was Thank wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you all. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.